Arthur, are you listening? You just need to sign the papers and we're finished. My wife, Annie, whom I've been married to for over 25 years, was speaking to me. I tried to pay attention, but her voice seemed to drift further away as her rant continued. It all began this afternoon when I came home from work. Annie sat at the table with a glass of wine and a determined expression. Unfortunately, she only had one glass, neglecting to consider if I might want one too, especially given the direction our conversation was taking. I sensed trouble brewing as I sat down. Without asking about my day, Annie plunged into the news that she was leaving me. She claimed to have found her soulmate, someone who made her happier than I ever did, rendering me no longer adequate. Despite her escalating volume, her words became increasingly distant to me. Our story followed a familiar pattern. We met in high school, stayed together, and welcomed our daughter Sally shortly after getting married. While she wasn't the primary reason we tied the knot, she was always part of the plan. Presently, we both held steady jobs, lived comfortably, and had managed to pay off our house with some savings to boot. We frequently professed our love, took family vacations, and though our physical closeness had waned over time, we still found moments of closeness. I believed our love ran deep, and we were destined to grow old together until this afternoon. Annie's rant continued, her face reddening with each passing moment. Arthur, look at me! It became increasingly difficult to focus, but I turned towards her. You need to sign these papers! She pointed adamantly at the documents before me. Her tone was demanding, yet I struggled to maintain concentration. It felt as though the room's brightness and color were fading, despite the kitchen lights being on. Internally, I was fraught with emotion, but externally my body remained unresponsive. The longer I remained silent, the angrier Annie grew. The last thing I remember is her slap, though I couldn't feel the impact. I imagined it leaving a prominent red mark, but still I couldn't move, and the world seemed to darken around me. It had been a long day. The drive home from university was delayed due to an accident slowing everyone down. When I arrived home, there was an eerie quietness in the house. The lights were on, Dad's car was in the driveway, but Mom's was nowhere to be seen. Upon entering the kitchen, I threw my bag and books on the ground. Dad sat at the table, motionless, staring into space. On the table lay an open bottle of Mum's wine and a mostly empty glass. In front of Dad were papers with numerous sign here tabs. Approaching Dad, I touched his shoulder from behind. Hey, Dad. I anticipated a response, but he remained unresponsive. Walking around to face him, I was taken aback. His eyes appeared glazed, almost milky white, with traces of tears staining his cheeks. He wasn't blinking, and a trail of drool hung from his mouth, threatening to drip into his lap. Panicked, I called out, Dad! Dad! Come back to me, Dad! Tears welled in my eyes. With no response from Dad, I tried to calm myself. Slow down, Sally. Dad needs help, I whispered to myself. Retrieving my phone, I dialed emergency. I explained that my father, Arthur Other, was unresponsive. After providing my details and address, they dispatched an ambulance, promising a 10-minute arrival time. I sat beside Dad, holding his hand, offering reassurance. This man had been my everything growing up. Despite his demanding job, he always made time for my school events, musicals, and ballet. He endured my early attempts at the violin, encouraging me every step of the way. On my 16th birthday, he surprised me with a Heidersign violin, not the best, but it held sentimental value as it came from him. Now, five years later, I was studying music at university with a focus on strings and violin, thanks to his unwavering support. As I waited, questions raced through my mind. Why was Dad like this? What had happened? And where was Mum? Glancing at the paperwork on the table, the words, Petition for Divorce, caught my eye. Shocked, I began reading, my skin crawling at the revelation that Mum wanted to divorce Dad for reasons unknown to me. It appeared highly likely that Dad's condition stemmed from the documents, especially considering Mum's open wine bottle, indicating she had given Dad the papers and left. People often speculate on the rapid fluctuation of emotions. I suppose they've never experienced such a betrayal. For me, any compassion and desire to be in my mother's presence faded away. Shortly after, the ambulance arrived, and I directed them in getting Dad onto a gurney and off to the hospital. After locking up the house, I followed behind, making calls as I drove. 
I contacted my grandmother, dad's mom, his sister Rhonda, his best friend, and then his manager at work, informing them of dad's situation and his impending absence. I explained that I found him unresponsive and that he was en route to the hospital. Everyone requested updates on his condition, and his manager assured me of arranging emergency leave and informing their boss. I knew I was putting off the next call, consumed with anger, but I felt compelled to call mom. The phone rang, and she answered after a couple of rings. Hi, Sally, my darling, how was your day? I was taken aback by her casual tone. Surely she couldn't be so naive as to think I wouldn't know what was happening. It had been almost an hour since I found Dad, and Mom was well aware of my routine. Where are you, Mom? I'm out and about, sweetie. She trailed off, sensing my inquiry. So, in other words, you've just shattered my father, your husband, and left him without a second thought. Oh no, darling, I tried to explain to your father about Paul and the situation, but he wasn't responsive, so I thought it best to leave and let him process that we won't be living with him anymore. Her attempt to downplay the situation infuriated me. Given Dad's state, it seemed more likely that she had ripped his heart out and left it shattered before him. It appears to me like you abandoned him when he needed help. Are you truly that heartless? Do you even understand what's happening now or do you simply not care? Anger began to seep into my voice. Sweetie, don't get angry now. I understand this is a shock, but your father will be fine. I'm only asking for what is rightfully mine and some support while Paul and I wait to marry. Yep, my mother was firmly in La La Land. Angry? You haven't seen angry yet, mother. And just so you know, I'm currently following dad to the hospital. He's in an ambulance, and when I got home, he looked like he'd had a stroke. Oh, Sally, my sweetie, I'm sorry to hear that, but... No excuses, mother. Let me ask you, is this Paul you're running off with the same Paul from your work that you keep talking about? She hesitated. Of course, darling. Paul, the man from my mother's workplace she never stopped mentioning. So, let me get this straight. He's a dozen years younger than you, and you've been having an affair with him for how long? Again, she hesitated. Six months. Right. So for the last six months, you've been involved with someone from your workplace behind Dad's back. You've been lying to Dad and me, hiding your affair. I had no idea you were capable of such deceit, and clearly neither did Dad, judging by the state you left him in. How did you expect either of us to react? Well, I suppose not positively at first, but once we're living with Paul, you'll see we're meant to be together. We? She had just referred to we for the second time. Did she expect me to abandon Dad to move in with her and her boyfriend? I could feel my anger boiling over. I knew I would say something regrettable if I didn't stop. I'm going to hang up now before I say something I might regret. But let me be crystal clear. I will not be leaving Dad, and there's no way I'm going anywhere near Paul, let alone moving into the place you and he are cavorting in. Sally Other, my mother responded sharply. I am your mother, and I will not be spoken to like that, regardless of how upset you are. Then I guess we're done talking. I hung up before she could say anything else. If she thought I would condone what she was doing, she had another thing coming. She tried calling me back multiple times, then started calling Dad's phone, which was silly because if he could, I doubted he would pick up a call from her. Since I had Dad's phone with me, I ignored any calls from her. By the time I reached the hospital, the ambulance crew had admitted Dad, and he was in a ward under observation. Aunt Rhonda had arrived and informed me that she had also received several calls from my mother, but wasn't sure what was happening other than her brother being in the hospital. When I explained the situation, Aunt Rhonda turned a deep shade of scarlet, almost as if steam were coming out of her ears. Sally, do you have the documents that woman left for my brother? Sure, Aunt Rhonda, here you go. Aside from being my aunt, Rhonda was also our family attorney. For the next hour, we sat beside Dad as Rhonda read through the documents, occasionally muttering under her breath. Doctors and nurses came in and out of the room periodically, checking on Dad. Well, the bad news is that your mother is going to get her divorce from your father. The schedule outlined here shows that this process has been in motion for over two months and had to be served this week, or it would have incurred significantly higher fees from her legal team. I shrugged. 
I had heard enough justification from my mother. I was determined to ensure that she and Dad separated for what she had done. It was strange. I was never particularly close to my father, always looking up to my mom, but her actions seemed plain foolish. This whole mess seemed to be orchestrated by Paul, her so-called soulmate. Regardless, Mom and Dad weren't going to weather this storm, especially if Dad's current condition was any indication. The good news is that she hired a shyster of a lawyer to represent her. She's going to have to shell out a hefty sum just for the divorce and even more if it goes to court. Rhonda grinned. Meanwhile, my dear brother has the best lawyer in town and he's getting the family discount. We shared a smile for the first time that evening. Additionally, some of the claims here, like wanting 50% equity in the house and 60% of the financial assets, along with spousal and child maintenance, are likely quite exaggerated. I assume from your reaction that you're not planning to live with your mother. I shook my head in confirmation. Good. Okay. I have some initial thoughts. However, we need to see what happens with your dad over the next 24 hours. Your mother could already be in hot water for abandonment and mental cruelty. The next few days flew by, with doctors constantly checking on Dad. Physically, he was fine and healthy, but he remained unresponsive. I managed to continue my university studies in the hospital chair by his bed, laptop, and textbook in hand. Occasionally, a family member would relieve me, allowing me to go home, catch a few hours of sleep, and return. I'll admit, I shed a few tears at home, alone in the house. One of the most surprising moments during Dad's hospital stay was when Tina Williams, the owner of the company where Dad worked, paid him a visit. While I knew Dad's manager, Tom, I had never met Tina herself. Tina was a striking woman, curvaceous without being overweight, with tan skin, dark raven hair, and mesmerizing blue eyes that could make any person, male or female, swoon. As it turned out, Dad had been part of a group at his workplace that had supported Tina a few years back during her messy divorce. Her unfaithful ex-husband had attempted to claim a significant portion of their savings and nearly succeeded in taking half of her business. Dad had introduced her to Aunt Rhonda, who had successfully protected Tina's assets, ensuring she didn't lose any business shares and securing child support for her then six-year-old daughter. Tina visited Dad several times, expressing shock when I briefed her on the general summary of why he was hospitalized. She brought cards from everyone at Dad's workplace and spent time holding his hand, sharing stories from the office. It turned out Dad had a knack for humor in the workplace, and his absence was deeply felt by his colleagues. I should mention that Dad is an accountant by profession, working for one of the financial clearinghouses that assist banks in processing payments to financial institutions. While the work may be tedious, Dad apparently brightened up the workday for everyone with his humor and presence. About two weeks later, I returned from a shower and a nap at home to find Rhonda and Tina in the midst of a conversation. Although it seemed a bit heated, their frustration was aimed at my mother rather than each other. It turned out that my mother had sent a demand letter to Tina, requesting access to all of Dad's bonuses from the past few years. It didn't matter that the bonuses had already been paid out, the letter demanded that she receive 50% of them within 30 days into a designated bank account, or she would pursue legal action against Tina. Besides the absurdity of her claim for money already dispersed, it seems like she and her new partner are in dire financial straits since I've frozen all the joint assets while Arthur is incapacitated, Rhonda remarked, sporting a exploitative grin. I chuckled, making my presence known. Yes, this morning I received my first communication from mom in two weeks, a text message asking if I could lend her a few thousand dollars. I haven't responded because I'm still pretty upset with her. I mean, she hasn't even asked about dad since I told her what she did to him. Over the past couple of weeks, Tina had become fiercely protective of my dad. Whenever my mother was brought up, Tina's eyes narrowed, her voice dropping in pitch, indicating her deep disdain for Annie Uther. It was as if I could see sparks flickering around her smoldering eyes. I just hoped she never had to be in the same room with my mother, otherwise I feared she might incinerate her on the spot. Despite my current feelings toward my mother, she was still my mother. She has destroyed the most wonderful man. Sally, if it weren't for your father, I wouldn't have my Clarice or my business. 
So many people in the office helped me during one of the lowest points in my life. But your father took the time to listen to me. He never judged my ex-husband or me. He just let me talk. No one has ever done that without offering an opinion. He introduced me to your aunt here, ensuring I was taken care of. If he were single, I would have pursued him with everything I had after my divorce. I shrugged and let a smile grace my face. He won't be married much longer. Their faces registered realization, and Rhonda giggled while Tina smiled. Thanks, Sally. I needed that. I still can't believe what your mother has done to him or that she discarded such an amazing man. I need to head back to the office, but before I do... Tina walked over to my dad, and as Rhonda and I watched, she bent down and gave him a tender but sincere kiss on the lips. She looked up at us and smiled. However, her smile quickly turned into shock when my dad emitted a groan. As I gradually woke up, I sensed soft lips on mine, just the right amount of pressure, conveying a gentle and tender affection I hadn't felt in a long time. The hospital room's beeping and my groans reminded me of my surroundings. Anticipating Annie's presence as I opened my eyes after that affectionate kiss, I was surprised to find Tina standing there with a smile on her face. Tina? Approaching from the other side of the bed, Sally and Rhonda joined us. It's okay, Daddy. You're going to be okay, you hear? As my memories caught up with me, I realized Annie was leaving me, or had already left. What happened? Over the next few minutes, the three of them filled me in on how Sally had found me unresponsive, called an ambulance, and discovered the divorce papers, revealing Annie's months-long infidelity. I learned how Annie had threatened Tina once Rhonda froze our finances until they could determine my condition. How long? Two weeks, Arthur, Rhonda replied. I turned to Tina. Um, you kissed me? Tina blushed. Yeah, sorry, I was about to head back to the office and was saying goodbye. I smiled. No, it's okay. I guess I'm on the market, so I think it's okay. Over the next few hours, various doctors came through, conducting physical checkups, blood tests, and more. Tina canceled her visit to the office and stayed, along with Rhonda and Sally. Among the doctors was a psychologist. As he probed into my experiences, I recounted finding Annie alone, drinking, and her announcement of leaving me. I described how the world seemed to lose color and sensory input became disjointed, making it difficult to move despite growing upset. My last memory was of Annie slapping and yelling at me, her words incomprehensible. The girls collectively gasped at the revelation of Annie's aggression while I was unable to respond. Dad, what time do you think it was when you became unresponsive? I'd say it was around 5.30, baby. Why? Because it was past 7.30 when I got home and found you, and there was no red mark on your cheek. So I assume Mom must have left you there alone for quite some time. The psychologist interjected. It's not uncommon for someone in your situation to experience misuse while unresponsive. In your case, I'd say you went into shock upon hearing your wife's declaration of leaving you. Although this is a much more extreme case than usual, it does make sense. Rhonda added, When Arthur was young, there was a bully a few years older than him. He teased Arthur quite a bit, and one day a neighborhood parent found Arthur lying on the ground in a local park. Our parents put him to bed, and he woke up the next morning. It wasn't overthought as he woke up regularly the next day, but it did happen. I recalled, I remember Billy pushing me around and teasing me in the park. After a while, I didn't know what happened, but when I woke up, Mom and Dad told me I had passed out and someone brought me home. When I told them about Billy, they spoke to his parents. The next day, Billy came up to me at school and apologized. I chuckled at the memory. I don't think he was sincere, but he never bothered me again after that day. I believe we may have a precedent here, the psychologist mentioned. In many ways, the mind remains poorly understood. However, if something similar has occurred before, it's plausible it could happen again. I frowned he reassured. I wouldn't worry too much. With the love and attention of these three lovely ladies, even if something were to happen again, I believe you will be well taken care of. We conversed for a few more minutes before he excused himself. I also found myself fatigued, which might seem odd for someone who had just slept for the past two weeks. But I was. So, I sent all three girls home to rest, and informed them they could visit me tomorrow to ensure I was all right. Over the next two days, I eased back into life. Tina brought me a work laptop and a few simple tasks to complete with instructions, only if I felt bored. 
Rhonda visited primarily to review her revised divorce documents and to have me sign some papers so she could proceed with ending my marriage to Annie. Rhonda also brought along a young detective, Karen Hill. Detective Hill conducted an hour-long interview with me regarding my experience that night with Annie. She thanked me and informed Rhonda and me that her report would be ready in a few days. I wasn't certain if we were planning to file a complaint against Annie. Eventually, however, Rhonda instructed me to leave everything to her, kissed me on the forehead, and departed. On the second day afternoon, after waking up from what Sally dubbed my checkout, I was discharged to return home. Sally accompanied me, and I was surprised to find Tina waiting at the door. She assisted Sally in guiding me to her large suburban SUV. Tina stayed for dinner that night. We opted for takeout, and she pitched in to clean up before staying to watch TV with us for a couple of hours. When she left, Sally hugged her and made sure I walked her to her car. Tina, thank you so much for everything you've done these past few weeks. I don't know how I can repay you. Well, in a few weeks, when you're feeling back on your game, you can take me out for dinner and dancing. I blushed. Here I was, just an afternoon out of the hospital, and the woman whose kiss had awakened me was asking me out. But she was attractive, and according to Annie, I was to be a single man again. Okay, next Friday night after work, that gives me almost two weeks to get myself back to normal. She nodded and gave me a warm hug. It lingered a little longer, and I sensed a deeper meaning. As she got into her car, I found it amusing that for a moment I wondered about the name of the woman I had been married to for almost 25 years. For the next few days, Sally, Rhonda, and Tina hovered around me, ensuring I was all right. It was comforting to be cared for in such a way. However, the news Rhonda brought me that Friday afternoon caught all of us a little off guard. This afternoon, Annie got arrested, she announced. What happened? I inquired. Well, after your statement to the police at the hospital, they issued an arrest warrant for Annie on grounds of mental cruelty to a person with a disability. This is because you were mentally disabled and unable to defend yourself at the time. Also, she left you unattended for an unspecified period, which adds to her troubles, she explained. What does this mean for the divorce? Tina, who had joined us again for dinner, asked. That evening, she had her eight-year-old daughter Clarice with her, who was watching a Disney movie in the lounge room while we conversed. With Monday marking my return to work, Tina would see me then. However, I was starting to grasp that she was seeking more than just an efficient number cruncher in the office. I found myself not objecting to the idea of Tina and picturing her, contemplating what lay beneath those nicely fitting clothes she wore whenever she visited. Rhonda grinned. It's likely going to tilt a few things in Arthur's favor. I'm advocating for a 50-50 split of the bank accounts in the house. I know we could aim for more given the circumstances, but I reckon Arthur would want to be fair. I nodded. Annie won't be able to touch any of the bonus money she tried to extract from you, Tina. I filed a case against her for extortion alongside the mental cruelty charge. It won't do much except prevent her from accessing what isn't rightfully hers. She'll probably be out in a couple of days, none the worse for wear, and likely back with her wretched soulmate. What I aim to do is expedite the divorce using Arthur's hospitalization and recovery as a pretext. Then, depending on her reaction, I have plans in motion. I'll ensure Arthur doesn't lose anything he shouldn't, she said, smiling. So, how long will the divorce take, Aunt Rhonda? Sally inquired. Assuming everything goes smoothly, it should take around three months. After that, if Annie decides to contest anything, I'll bring in reinforcements which will prolong the process but inflict more damage on her, Rhonda explained. That evening, as I escorted Tina to her car, Sally assisted Clarice into the back seat of the large suburban. Tina embraced me once again and surprised me with a quick kiss, reminiscent of the other day. Arthur, I know you're married, and you're a man of honor, so I won't rush things. But I want to lay claim to you now and let you know that I desire you. I've wanted you for a long time, of course, but I'd never pursue a married man or disrespect someone's marital vows. I've experienced that myself, and I wouldn't want to inflict that on someone else, even if their marriage is in trouble, Tina expressed sincerely. For a moment, I gazed into her deep blue eyes, brushed a strand of her dark hair from her face, and then leaned in to kiss her. Instead of a tender kiss, it became one filled with passion, lasting perhaps 30 seconds. I sensed the mutual connection between us. When I pulled back, Tina's eyes were closed, and she ran her tongue over her lips, savoring our kiss. I grinned. Consider that my acknowledgement of your claim. We glanced at the girls, both of them giggling at our kiss. Clarice was clapping, and Sally sported a huge grin. 
As Tina and Clarice drove off, Sally hugged me and we waved goodbye. The following months were quite a ride. On one hand, Annie wanted a speedy divorce, but on the other, she wasn't content with the settlement. It seemed Paul was calling the shots, convincing her she deserved the lion's share of the assets. He was feeding her lies, and deep down, she must have realized it after so many years of marriage. As her settlement demands grew more absurd, Rhonda had a single conversation with Annie's lawyer, and whatever was said put an end to all objections overnight. Tina and I went on dates every Friday night while Sally began babysitting Clarice, picking her up from school and looking after her, giving Tina and me time for dinner, coffee, and entertainment. Though we never went beyond holding hands and kissing, I had a feeling the night my divorce finalized would be unforgettable. Back at work now, things were going smoothly. While we were a successful financial organization, we weren't in the big leagues. We all did our jobs, were well compensated, and enjoyed each other's company. I think the staff caught on to Tina and me becoming an item at some point. Although everyone was happy for us, I had to dial back my usual antics. My direct manager, who reported to Tina, made sure to remind me of appropriate workplace behavior, considering I was essentially dating his boss. About three and a half months later, we received a notification that the divorce would be finalized one week from the upcoming Thursday. There were no court proceedings. However, Annie had requested a meeting to discuss matters before the final decree. I agreed to meet the day before, and we arranged for her to visit the house to speak with both Sally and me. I had taken the afternoon off from work and prepared lamb chops and gnocchi in a burnt butter sauce for the three of us. It was a favorite meal for all of us, and I hoped it would help ease any potential awkwardness during our conversation that evening. Sally arrived home around 5.30, went to shower and change, and just before 6, the doorbell rang, signaling Annie's arrival at the front door. I haven't described Annie's appearance in some time, but perhaps I should now, with a before and after perspective. Before everything unfolded a few months ago, Annie was an attractive mid-forties housewife. She had cropped shoulder-length brown hair, a curvy figure typical of a mother, and although carrying a few extra pounds, she was still quite attractive. With a well-proportioned 34C bust and an appealing rear, she was an attractive wife. Unfortunately, the woman standing before me now was almost unrecognizable. Annie had gained a significant amount of weight, developed jowls under her chin and puffy cheeks. Her stomach, which had previously had a slight mom belly, now sagged over her pants, and her once curvy posterior had expanded. Furthermore, she was dressed in loose-fitting clothes that concealed even more. Now I have nothing against people of larger size but that wasn't the Annie I knew. I think my surprise at her physical transformation was evident on my face, although Annie made no comment about it, merely grimacing in response. Um, hello Annie, please come in, I greeted as we entered the kitchen. I offered her a glass of wine, which she accepted, and we engaged in small talk for a few minutes. She inquired about work and my well-being while I skipped the inquiry about her health. It's what Paul wants. He didn't like how thin I was, so we've been working on bulking me up she addressed the unspoken question. I frowned. For over 25 years, I had cherished this woman. Despite her actions, a lingering concern for her health remained, albeit greatly diminished. You don't approve, do you? She looked at me. No, Annie, I don't. When we were together, you were a healthy size. But I'll be honest, I'm taken aback by your appearance. You don't seem well, and if I weren't so hurt by what you did, I'd be more concerned about your health and try to help, I expressed. But you don't care, do you? her expression fell. You and Sally, you're happy and healthy without me here. Well, there's a part of me that cares, but when you walked out of here and practically left me for dead, I trailed off, shrugging while she sighed. I deserve that. I did a terrible thing, didn't I? No, mother, Sally interjected, appearing fresh from the shower. You did a freaking horrible thing. You single-handedly tore apart a happy family, then walked out without a care in the world. And I, for one, can't understand why dad agreed to let you come here tonight. Sally, calm down, I intervened. Your mother knows the situation we're in and how unhappy we all are. She requested this meeting tonight, so I thought the least we could do is be mature and hear her out. Sally wasn't pleased. As far as I could tell, like me, she hadn't spoken to her mother since that momentous day. The way my daughter was glaring at her mother, this situation wouldn't end well for anyone. It was time to steer the conversation elsewhere. Attempting a cheerful tone, I suggested... Tough discussions aren't ideal right before dinner, so let's eat first. I served dinner, and though no one spoke, there were numerous glances exchanged across the table. Sally maintained a steady glare at her mother throughout the meal. 
After dinner, I cleared the table and Annie requested to speak to Sally alone. No way! You can say whatever you want to me with both of us present, Sally retorted firmly. I felt torn, but it was evident Sally was resolute about not being left alone with her mother. Annie seemed to sense that too. The look in her eyes mirrored what her mother had done to me on that fateful night. She acquiesced. Annie took a deep breath, hesitant to discuss matters in front of me, but she addressed Sally. Well, Sally, I wanted to ask for your forgiveness for what happened that night. I didn't handle things properly, and despite everything, I don't want to estrange my daughter forever. Glancing at me, Annie added, There's more, but I'd prefer to discuss it in private, without your father present. Sorry, Mom, but if you can't say it to both of us, then I don't want to hear it, Sally declared. Before Annie could respond, Sally stood up and left the room, slamming her bedroom door shut moments later. I hoped that would go better, Annie murmured softly, more to herself than to me. I think considering the circumstances it went rather smoothly, I replied, letting her know I understood. Really? Annie sounded surprised. Yes, really, I sighed, continuing. Annie, you need to realize that at this moment nobody in this house holds much affection for you. She started to reply, but I raised my hand, signaling her to let me finish and lay everything out. First, you engage in a long-term carnal affair with someone, then conceal it from both Sally and me. Next, you serve me with divorce papers out of the blue, and when I enter what Sally refers to as checkout mode, you proceed to yell, scream, and then slap me, Annie appeared stunned, like a deer caught in headlights. Yes, I remember that, and I recall most of that time until shortly after you first slapped me. But let's continue. At some point, you abandon me when I am unresponsive, leaving me there until Sally arrives home and discovers me in the same state, I recounted. Annie's expression turned to panic. When Sally calls you, you show no concern for me despite your daughter being visibly distressed about her father. You never once inquire about my well-being until tonight, make unreasonable demands of my workplace, and upon entering here, it's still all about you. You ask Sally for forgiveness, yet you have not apologized to her at any point. I paused briefly, hoping my words would resonate. Yes, Annie, with all of that considered, I think things went quite well. Annie's gaze shifted to the floor, tears welling in her eyes. They hadn't yet fallen, but they lingered threateningly. I couldn't discern whether they were for Sally, myself, or simply a reflection of her own emotions. Continuing, I stated, now our divorce will be finalized tomorrow, and unless you have anything further to add, I believe we have fulfilled your request for a final meeting. I walked to the door and opened it. Annie glanced at me before exiting. Once outside, she turned to look at me. Arthur, we did have some good years, didn't we? Yes, Annie, most of our time together was incredible. You were an exceptional lover, a devoted wife, and a loving mother. I'm not sure what this Paul character has done to you, but I don't see the woman I fell in love with in the person standing before me. All I see is someone who seems lost, manipulated into becoming overweight, self-centered, and caring more about what others can provide for you than the people themselves. Once again, she lowered her gaze to her feet. You truly mean that, don't you, Arthur? Yes, I do, I affirmed. She turned to leave but hesitated, looking utterly broken this time. Arthur, about the house, Paul told me I needed to ask. So that was the purpose of her visit. It wasn't about reconnecting with her family. It was solely about money. I chuckled, leaving Annie puzzled by my reaction. Go tell your soulmate that you'll have your share of the savings and the equity from this house transferred to the bank account your lawyer provided to Rhonda by this time tomorrow. And Annie, she glanced at me, protect that money from Paul or you won't have it for long. Update. The next morning marked the final decree, and Annie and I were officially no longer husband and wife. There was a small twinge of sadness within me but it was fleeting. Mostly, I felt content. The past few months had been challenging for everyone. Now, at 48 years old, I felt liberated, knowing I still had much life left to live. Rhonda phoned to inform me that pizza was on her tonight at my place. During lunch at the office, Sally dropped by. We reminisced about happier times with her mother when we were a complete family. Despite Sally's dislike for her mother, I could sense she missed the woman she once was. Truthfully, I did too. We shared many good years together. As Sally left, there seemed to be a silent exchange between her and Tina. Not long after, I was summoned to Tina's office. She closed the door and then kissed me passionately, as if the sun might never rise again. I must admit, I responded in kind. Can I claim you as mine now, Arthur? Tina asked. 
I felt a sore spot on my neck, likely from a bruise forming where she had just kissed me moments before. I think you may have already done that. That evening's dinner was delightful, with Sally, Rhonda, Tina, and Clarice all joining in to celebrate my newfound freedom from Annie. Later that Friday night after the girls were in bed, Tina and I consummated our relationship. I must have done something right because throughout the weekend, Tina seemed a bit sore whenever she sat down, but her eyes burned with a fiery passion that I knew was reserved for me alone. Six months later, we tied the knot in a beautiful ceremony by a local lake with many of our colleagues in attendance. Though we initially planned to marry later, we decided to move the date up to coincide with the arrival of Sally and Clarice's new little brother. Update. Five years had passed, and Sally, her boyfriend Tina, and I were enjoying dinner at a local restaurant when five-year-old Keegan posed a question. Daddy, who is that lady who keeps staring at us? Turning to look, we spotted Annie sitting across the room. She had noticeably lost weight and appeared discontent. Since the divorce, we hadn't seen or heard from her, and she hadn't attempted to contact Sally. Excusing myself from the table, I approached her. Hi, Annie. Hi, Arthur. How are you? I inquired. She glanced down at her chicken salad, replying, You were right, Arthur. You were right about him. Paul convinced me I was his soulmate, and you meant nothing to him. But when I didn't receive the money up front, he persuaded me to gain weight because he loved me and preferred overweight women. After receiving the divorce settlement, you advised me not to give it to him. But I didn't listen. He squandered it in six months and then abandoned me. Though I was still upset with her, her story lacked the happy ending mine had. Since then, I've spent every moment trying to rebuild the confidence he shattered and reclaim some semblance of my former self, she confessed, holding back tears as she looked at me. After all these years, that look resembled the Annie I once knew. Arthur, I am so sorry. I treated you horribly. I did it because I believed Paul knew things you didn't. I abandoned the man who truly loved me, leaving you unresponsive and... She paused, gripping the table's edge. You could have died because of my actions... I know you can never forgive me, but I want to apologize. Tears streamed openly down her face. Surprisingly, Sally had joined us, standing beside me, also witnessing her mother's apology. She gave me a weary smile, grabbed my hand, and extended her hand to her mother. Seeing Sally and then witnessing her extending her hand, Annie panicked, attempting to leave. But Sally blocked her path. Mom, stop! You don't need to leave! Sally asserted. Sliding into the booth next to Annie, Sally and I joined her. I glanced at Tina, who nodded in agreement. For the next hour, mother and daughter conversed. There were many tears shed, but for once, they were healing, not hurtful. Once they caught up, Sally and I reintroduced Annie to everyone else. Annie seemed a bit unsettled when introduced to Keegan as Auntie Annie. Following that day, we gradually welcomed Annie back into our lives. Sally and her mother reconnected slowly, meeting for coffee every week or two. Trust developed gradually between them, but eventually solidified. When Sally got married, Annie had the opportunity to play the role of mother of the bride. Tina occasionally invited Annie over for dinner at our house. Initially, I suspected it was to spite Annie for what she had lost, and Tina had gained by marrying me. However, while they never became close friends, Tina and Annie developed an odd sort of friendship that I never quite understood. Rhonda never forgave Annie for the injury she inflicted on me, although she remained polite when they encountered each other. With Tina's approval, Annie and I engaged in some post-marriage counseling. We addressed many of the issues from our past, spanning over five years ago. The counselor speculated that Annie might have been experiencing hormonal imbalances, but Annie vehemently rejected this notion. No, I threw away the most precious things in my life that day. I had a loving husband and a daughter who wanted to be with me. No hormonal imbalance can justify how I destroyed everything good in my life for someone who was nothing but trouble in bed and had an inadequate appendage, she remarked with a sweet smile directed at me. Arthur and Sally deserve better for me, she admitted tearfully, dabbing her eyes with a tissue. It took me five years to reconnect with them. I thank God every day that Arthur has allowed me back into his life. And Tina, too, she blushed, acknowledging Tina's warmth towards her despite everything. She had every reason to hate me, yet she has always treated me kindly. I got lucky losing everything I discarded, and I will bear that burden for a long time. Annie gained more from those counseling sessions than I did. It was reassuring to confirm that neither Sally nor I were responsible for Annie's decision to leave us. And she was right. Tina had lifted us up and forged a stronger family bond. 
They say people pay for their mistakes eventually, and Paul did. He moved to another state and once again attempted to manipulate a married woman for her money. This time, however, the woman's husband caught Paul in the act and took matters into his own hands, rendering Paul incapable. The husband received a ten-year sentence, but if Rhonda's rumors were accurate, he might be released sooner. Tina and I are still deeply in love. I never imagined I could love anyone as much or as deeply as I did Annie, but Tina proved me wrong. She not only gave me her love, but also her soul wholeheartedly. We continue to work together in her company, and I'm still in the same job. While we have our ups and downs, we always prioritize communication when it matters. Her physique remains remarkable, and we still make love frequently. We've even indulged in lovemaking moments in exotic locations while on vacation. Often, just one glance is enough to lead us locking the bedroom door and passionately indulging in each other. Once, after we had finished making love, showered, and dressed, we entered the kitchen to find Sally and Annie engaged in conversation. We had recently learned that Sally was expecting, sparking excitement as the girls discussed the arrival of my first grandchild. My goodness, Sally, you'd think these two were teenagers with the way they behave. Tina, you'll have to let me in on your secret to keeping Arthur so lively. Maybe I can get some tips to keep Fred on his toes, Sally teased. Amidst laughter, I blushed. Annie had been casually dating lately, but nothing serious until Fred entered the picture. Mom, let them be. We all know that Dad has been on a mission since... You know. Sally teased mischievously, her eyes twinkling. Annie hesitated while Sally laughed and Tina blushed. I simply leaned back, smirked at my girls, and felt myself stirred again by Tina's presence. Eventually, I excused myself, making my way back to the bedroom, with Tina following shortly after, locking the door behind her.